the residents of this small East Texas town are used to living the quiet life. Emory, Texas was the picture of what easy country living was meant to be. But on a night in March 2008, something happened just outside this peaceful town that no one could have imagined or predicted. Something so violent the fabric of the entire community was torn. Well, I got the call, I think, about 3 a.m. is when I actually got the call, I think. Of course, when I got there, there were so many units, uh, Larry Red Lights, Blue Lights, and, and trying to figure out what was going on. And, you know, I mean, it was, the fire was still raging pretty good. It was uh, the, the, the scope of violence that you just don't expect that in a small rural community like this. What he told me in the brief instances that we talked was just absolutely horrifying that the rest of his family was in the house and the house was fully engulfed in flames. I just can't believe that some young kids could pull that off and, and do what they did to a family. Terry Caffey's family moved to a home just outside of Emory to be closer to the Miracle Faith Church where Caffey served as youth pastor. Caffey's oldest child, Aaron, turned 16 and wanted to get a job at the local Sonic drive-in like most teenagers tend to do. But it was at this job where Aaron met Charlie Wilkerson, and life for this family would change forever. She didn't talk about it at first until I guess a, a month or two had gone by. She had been communicating with Charlie that she came home and said, I think she told her mom first that, I met somebody, I want y'all to meet him, and that kind of thing. And I said, well, I, I certainly want to meet this young man. <laughs> and I said, well, let's just have him over for dinner one night, and uh, we'll get to know him, and we'll just go from there and see, you know, see what happens. Immediately, I, I knew I didn't like him, and I think, you know, at first, Penny was like, well, I think you're just being, you're, that's just the dad in you, being overprotective. And I said, you know, partly, maybe so, but there was there was just something that, that just didn't seem right because, you know, I, I remember uh, walking in and he's sitting in my recliner and well, that's no problem, but I walk in, he's sitting down, I come over and I stick my hand, I say, hello, you must be Charlie. And he looked at me and said, yeah, and you are? Just like that. And I was like, he just didn't do that, did he? Terry and Penny Caffey believed their daughter's relationship with Charlie was not moving in a positive direction. The Caffeys were stunned to find out that Charlie had given Aaron a large ring, signifying Charlie's intention to be in Aaron's life forever. And so I went and found Aaron, and she's got this big diamond ring. It wasn't some cheap thing. It was it looked like a pretty nice, expensive ring. And I think it was his mother's or grandmother's ring or whatever. And I said, as a matter of fact, I want, I want to see you tomorrow at the house, tomorrow evening, I want to sit down and talk to you and Aaron both. We're going to set down some ground rules. Terry and Penny began to set rules for the young couple. Curfews were mandated. Charlie's visits to the family home were cut back to three or four a week. And the young couple's activities were limited. That Friday night when I came in from work, um, Aaron seemed to be happy. Um, the boys were acting, I mean, just nothing seemed out of, out of place, out of, you know, out of the ordinary. Seemed like we were getting the old Aaron back. But behind the scenes, Aaron and Charlie had been making plans for how they could spend the rest of their lives together. On the morning of March 1st, 2008, Charlie Wilkerson and his friend Charles Wade would break into the family's home with the plan of killing everyone and burning the home to the ground. But Terry Caffey survived the horrific ordeal and managed to find the strength to crawl to a neighbor's house to call for help. We had a black Labrador named Max and his bark seemed kind of different that night. So when they opened the door, they slung the door open. When it did, the doorknob hit the dryer and I remember that cling, that loud metal click sound. And I immediately jumped up and I'm thinking maybe it's Tyler came down, had a nightmare or something. And I, as soon as I set up, bam, 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 the gunfire went off. And I remember just being so loud. 
and it was just uh, it was almost I can't believe I, mean, I didn't know what it was going on at first and um, I realized quickly somebody's somebody standing over us shooting us but everything was happening so quickly me and Penny both were just screaming but I could hear somebody standing over me reloading the gun and I'm laying face down on the floor and I just knew in a minute this is going to be it they're going to finish me off I remember saying God just please be with my family and make it quick I just saw the blast muzzle um, and the, the smell of gun gun gunpowder it was so loud I remember that and I remember her saying no and screaming no no why are you doing this where's Terry where's Terry and I remember hearing Charlie's voice saying Terry's dead Terry's dead but by this time the house was just totally engulfed I mean it was just I can remember hearing windows explode out it was just intense heat and smoke and I, I couldn't get upstairs to the kids and I was forced back into the bedroom and I, I knew I was trying to get to the bathroom on the other side so I climbed over the bed trying to get away from the smoke and the flames and when I fell on the other side of the bed that's when I found Penny and one look at her I knew she's already gone so I climbed out the bathroom window I didn't care if I lived or died as a matter of fact I wanted to die but I knew that if I died out there in the woods that there's a good chance they may never find out who did this and I'm the only one that could identify the killers. So that became my strength and fight to stay alive. So I began to make my way to fight my way to my neighbors. But and I remember just pulling myself up, and I didn't have much strength. I I don't even know how I even stood up. But I stood up, and I was shaking and trembling. I said, God, if you'll just please give me the strength, keep me alive long enough to get to my neighbors. God help me. And when I said that, I as soon as I said that, I looked up towards my neighbors and I saw a little light shining in a distance, and I share this in my testimony a lot when I share my story. I didn't see that light there before, and at first I thought it was a flashlight coming to me, but I realized that light was fixed. I would later find out my neighbors, they kept their Benna Hood light on above their stove, and that was that faint light shining through that window. And, um, and I never saw that light there before, and I remember just focusing on that light. And, and, and I never looked back at the flames at that point, I just focused on that light, and I knew that if I took my eyes off that light, I wouldn't make it. Well, I got the call, I think, about 3 a.m. when I actually got the call. I think uh, Allman was there uh, ahead of me. You know, when I, it was just hard to imagine, of course, when I got there, there were so many units, uh, Larry Red Lights, Blue Lights, and, and trying to figure out what was going on. And, you know, I mean, it was, the fire was still raging pretty good. When I arrived, the first responding deputy, Charles Dickerson, was was there and the ambulance was there and they had just loaded Mr. Caffey in the ambulance when I arrived so I was able to talk to him before he was able to leave the scene. And what he, what he told me in the brief instances that we talked was just absolutely horrifying. That the rest of his family was in the house and the house was fully engulfed in flames. Um, it was just processing and and it just, it was just a day you'll never forget. Authorities used the information from Caffey to quickly track down Charlie Wilkinson, Charles Wade, and Bobby Johnson. But they were especially surprised to find Aaron Caffey hiding in the mobile home with the other suspect. I just can't believe that some young kids could pull that off and, and do what they did to a family, you know. It's just, it's just one of them things you hope you never see or hear of again. But, uh, and it's, like I say, for 29 years, that's the worst one that I've seen or been involved in. The impact of the crime hit Miracle Faith Baptist Church especially hard, where Caffey was youth pastor and his wife Penny played piano for the church. Pastor Todd McGahey found himself in several key roles. McGahey urged his congregation to pray not only for the people affected by the murders, but also for the four suspects accused of the crime. You know, it surprised me there were a few people that left the church after it, and I think that's probably why they did. They couldn't handle the stress of dealing with it, you know? But then, surprisingly, there were some people came, and I think that's why they came to the church, was because of it. I think there were some that were just curious, and then there were some that, you know, wanted to be a part of the church. We, I mean, I tried to make a point that 
we prayed for all three of them, or you know, four of them, because the one, the other girl was actually, her grandparents were members of the church as well. But it did teach me that God can do anything through me if I'll allow him to. Aaron Caffey, Charlie Wilkerson, Charles Wade, and Bobby Johnson are all serving prison sentences for their roles in the unthinkable crime that shook the core of this peaceful town. Their sentences for the crime involve a life behind bars. Terry Caffey was also dealt a sentence to a life behind the bars of anguish left from what happened that night. But one by one, those bars began to rust away. I, I want people to know that I, I've moved on. You know, I've got a wonderful life. I have a great wife and four beautiful children. When I tell my story, I talk about how difficult it is even to this day to go visit my daughter Erin, who's in prison. And that's difficult. And it's a reminder of her choices, but it also, not only is she facing these, um, facing the, the situation, being in prison because of her choices, others are affected. You know, when, when a young person, I let them know when you make a bad decision, it not, not only affects you, but it'll affect those around you, your parents, you know, your brothers, sisters, grandparents. So it has a, um, a long, a long lasting, I mean, it goes out and reaches out to so many people when you make those bad choices. Terry Caffey says he has forgiven all four young people for the crimes against his family. Charles Wade is serving a life sentence for his involvement and recently wrote about the importance of forgiveness and looking forward. I'm not proud of what I did or what I was a part of, but no matter what we do, we can't change the past and bring them back to life. If we could, it would have already been done. I believe now we have to learn from our mistakes and make the best of what we have left. We've heard it all, you know, that like you said, we live in an age of, of the internet and people can put anything they want to on there um, for various reasons. but. When I go share my story, like say I want to share at a church or do my testimony at a school, whatever, I have people came, come say, you know, I brought a box of t tissues expecting to leave here and be all gloom and doom. And then there may be some tears shed, don't get me wrong, but how many times I've heard when I get through speaking, people say, wow, this is totally not what I expect. I expected to walk out here and just be gloom and doom and golly, I'm sad. I'm, I'm encouraged, I'm uplifted, I'm, because I share what happened, but I always try to go and go share the good stuff. You know, I, I share where I was, but I never want to just share a tragic story. I want to share not just where I was, but where I'm at today. In the years that have followed this senseless tragedy, Terry Caffey has found strength in his faith. He is doing what many would find too painful. He is talking about his story. Through his own ministry, he shares his story with people across the country in hopes that his pain and his path to healing might help others who face challenges in their own lives. So I try not to, I don't make this, it's a part of my life, but I don't make it consume my life. Because I'll never be able to uh, change what happened. You know, I, even though I've healed and I forgive, but you'll never forget.